Good day. Uh, this is Dr. Battle here in Biblical Literature. And uh, today we're going to wrap up our presentation on the wisdom and poetic literature by helping us understand poetic structures. Just as a reminder, I want to remind you that the poetic literature is more aesthetic, meaning that it goes for beauty and emotive, meaning it goes for emotion. So one thing when you're having to deal with poetic and wisdom literature, especially the poetic literature, you have to understand that the emotions are uh, the focus and often the beauty is the focus. So while uh, you may go to the hospital and you know you sit in the hospital and they have that those those faces then you say well how they ask you how much pain is it on that scale of one to ten and they have all those faces and you'll select which one you want well that's a pretty that's trying to make an objective standard but an emotional side you might describe the pain as a as a, as a um, the tearing of your heart out of your chest well or something along that line or uh, uh, something along the line of uh, being um, uh, consumed with desire. You notice it's 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 more emotive in its description. It's not uh, based upon some st uh, uh, straightforward standard. It's describing how someone feels. That's why I just want to continue to remind you about poetic literature. In addition to that, poetic literature has aesthetics, things that have to do with the beauty, the way it's arranged, and uh, in biblical literature for poetics, um, the structure of poetics was first introduced or spelled out by a man named of, uh, Bishop Robert Loth, uh, and he, in his uh, lectures on Hebrew poetry, identified uh, certain aspects that are found in Hebrew poetry. Now, uh, since his time, it's been a lot more advanced, especially the third category that I'm about to share with you. But for an introductory level, this is fine. And the three levels that he saw, the three types of parallelisms that he saw within the Hebrew Bible, uh, uh, the, the poetic structure of the Hebrew Bible is based upon parallelisms or correspondences. And there are three types that are three basic types as loath to, to identify them. Synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. If you understand synonymous parallelism, just turn your Bibles to Psalm 24, verses 1 through uh, 2. And let's take a look at uh, the first line there. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so we can kind of see three parts, earth, is the Lord's and fullness thereof. And so you see these three elements here being expressed. Then all of a sudden it says the world and those who dwell in it. Now if you'll notice the, the Lord is missing, but it's, it is the Lord's is missing, but you could slot, put it right in after the word world. And so you could actually read this and the world is the Lord's and all those who dwell in it. And if you look at it, you see the parallelism is very synonymous. You have the word earth being parallel to the word world, and you see that in red. And you see in the green, the fullness thereof, everything that fills the earth, it belongs to God. And then the other phrase has in green there is those who dwell therein. Well, who, uh, what fills the earth? Well, people dwell the earth. Creatures dwell the earth. So you see the fullness of the earth. So you see this. Uh, this, these two lines are actually mirroring each other in what they're expressing. They're saying essentially the same thing from a slightly different perspective, but affirming the same. In fact, if you go on to verse 2, you see it again. For he has founded it upon the seas. Notice we can assume that it's God has founded it upon the seas. You see that the verb is founded. Where did he find it? Upon the seas. The next line, and established it upon the rivers. Now you see founded and established are parallel to each other and uh, communicate a similar thought. The founding and establishing are similar. Upon the seas, you see the water and upon the rivers. And so here you have a, uh, a, a corresponding thought. And uh, now granted, you could take for he has and actually add it to the second line and it would be there. But you see how the words kind of are synonymous and they're paralleling each other in a mirroring fashion. 
Typically, this type of fashioning is used to, say, be comprehensive, like they'll say the heavens and the earth. Well, no, let's get to the next one, sorry. The next one is antithetical, and here we have an antithetical one from Proverbs 1.8. And it says, Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and forsake not your mother's teachings. Now, what's interesting here, the... Um, uh, you see the hear and the blue and forsake not. Well, what does it mean to hear somebody in the ancient world? In the ancient world, to hear somebody was not to just hear their words, but to actually follow through on them. To forsake not was mean you don't neglect them. You don't just ignore them. So uh, you get the sense of what hearing is. And so a lot of times in biblical, you can actually get a sense of what a word means by how it's paired and what it's contrasted with. So to hear somebody is not to forsake them. Uh, to forsake somebody is not to hear them. You know, it's like if you ever deal with somebody and you tell them something and uh, they didn't hear you. They don't pay any attention to you. They forsake you. Uh, so you can see the par the antithetical thought here. Hearing is forsake not. And then you can see, c continue on seeing the antithetical nature because you have your fathers and your mothers. Uh, they're both parents, but they're different sides of the parenting coin. Uh, in fact, that kind of is a typical device that's found in the Hebrew Bible. They won't say the whole earth or the whole universe. What they'll say is the heavens and the earth. And that means everything. And so they'll typically use a parallelism along that line. So here you have your, so you need to pay attention to your parents' instructions, your fathers and your mothers. Then you have the word instructions. Now, in the ESV here, for some reason, uh, well, I know why, because they've translated the, the word uh, in the second line as teachings, because Torah can mean teaching, but it can also mean law. And I think it'd probably be better to go with law. Um, here for several reasons but here because that would force out the more antithetical instructions being uh, things that don't necessarily have force but law having and notice it cl clicks the law with the mother which is kind of un interesting considering that it was a patriarchal culture that they would have used the word with mother in place of father but at the point is being that uh, we need to listen and not forsake what our parents teach us, especially the good things that have been taught us. So you see here antithetical. You see now the two are actually expressing the same thought, but using opposite concepts. So it's called antithetical. Classic cl uh, class of, of parallelism, according to Loth, is synthetic. Now the synthetic one is a little artificial. Uh, is basically loath what he really did was if it wasn't par if it wasn't synonymous and it wasn't antithetical he threw it in here and this is the area where scholarship has really fine-tuned some things and here you see a synthetic parallelism found in Psalm 1 verses 1 through 2 it says blessed is the man and then it goes who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers now if you have your cultural background, you'll realize that this is an intensification. Now, in our culture, that sounds like a de, you know, it's, it's being de-emphasized. It's getting, you know, not as active. But in reality, what you have is is a intensification of each line. Uh, you know, first of all, you walk not in the counsel of the wicked. Now, in this case, notice it's counsel, way, and seat. See, the counsel is advice. So it's blessed is the person who doesn't live his life according to the advice of wicked people. Now, it's not saying the person is bad. It's just saying the person is following bad advice. And so the person is blessed because he's not living his life in the way, in the counsel, in the advice given by wicked people. So he's not living his life according to the horoscope, in other words. Now, the next one is a little bit more. Who stands in the way of sinners? Now here, uh, what you're talking about is the concept of a person who, uh, you know, stands in the way where they stand the road, and in the road, they, that's where they sell their wares. And so they haven't put their livelihood in the 
way of sinners. In other words, they're not selling, they're not uh, engaging in. So this is actually more intense. It's like if you go to many third world countries, you'll find many street vendors. Well, this is what's going on. They're standing in the street. They're standing in the way of sinners. They're actually participating in that lifestyle of sinners. So they're living in sin here. The next one is to sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, we in our culture typically view seating as a relaxed position. In the ancient world, they viewed seating more as a position of authority. Remember, it talks if you get in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus being seated at the right hand. Uh, it's not meaning that Jesus is resting. It means that he's taken up his position of authority. In fact, in the ancient world, the teacher would sit and the students would stand. Um, and so you would be expected the teacher would sit from the seat of authority from which he taught. And so here, notice it sits in the seat of scoffers. Now it's gone from a person accepting the counsel of wicked. It's then actually participating in the wicked lifestyle. Now this is a person who actively makes fun of righteousness and what's good. And so now we see a scoffer. Notice how that each level is being intensified. Each line intensifies the previous line here. So be aware of these things. Now sometimes we have to have a little cultural background to understand it. But yet if you looked at it, you know, a counsel versus scoffers would give you a sense of the difference between that there was some intensification there even if you did not have the cultural background. Let's go on to another one. Here are some other common poetic structures and devices that we can look at. Uh, one is an inclusio. An inclusio is where you have the, uh, uh, it's kind of like bookends. You have the first line and the last line of something saying the same. So if you were to open up, and we'll be going to Psalm 8 in just a little bit, but if you were to open up your Bibles to Psalm 8, you would see and read verse 1, you would read, O oh Lord, how O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, if you go to verse 9, the last verse, it says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's kind of like a song that starts with the same refrain and ends with the same refrain. But it's kind of like a bookend. They, they bracket things off. Another device that is used is the acrostic. Now, you won't be able to see this because you don't have a Hebrew Bible, but if you open up to Hebrew, uh, Psalm 119, and you look through Psalm 119, you'll see it starts off with a Aleph, and you'll see this little Aleph written there, and then a little later, in about, uh, uh, I think it's around seven or eight verses, then you'll see the Beit, or, uh, Beit and then you'll see a Gimel. What's telling you there is those are, if you want to learn your Hebrew alphabet, the names of the Hebrew alphabet, you just go down Psalm 119, and each stanza has another name for the next uh, letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Well, what it's telling you is that every verse in that stanza in the Hebrew begins with that letter. And so you'll have in several places of the Bible where the letters are done in sequence. Lamentations does this in a very interesting fashion. The book of Lamentations starts out with a very regular acrostic. That as, as the song continues its lament begins to fall apart. And so you get the sense through the acrostic of a person who's starting out, you know, expressing their feelings. But as they get along there, they become more and more emotional and more discombobulated. And you just see that through the poetry. It's kind of like the same thing we see in Shakespeare where I am told that uh, a lot of you have a regular beat for your most of your speakers but if a certain speaker is slightly insane it is the beat becomes irregular but you have a similar device used in acrostic there with Psalm 119 so now there's one that's very interesting in the scriptures called the chiasmus or chiasm and it's one that's used extensively throughout the Bible and one that uh, can be when you start seeing it can be quite fruitful in your studies now, chiasm uh, is a very interesting device. Uh, we'll have to look at Psalm 1-3 here in just a moment, and then we'll look at it on a larger scale in Psalm 8. 1 verse 3. Uh, let's take a look at the first line. It says, but his delight is, and that we call that A, and it goes, is in the law of the Lord. Now notice this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And so we have this first line giving us, 
are uh, uh, these two parts that his delight is in the law of the Lord. When we get to the next one, we come to what's called B prime. And notice it reflects the ending of the first line. And on his law, you see the law of the Lord and his law. Well, we can assume in this case that the his law is the Lord's law. So in the law of the Lord and in on his law, what? He comes out, he meditates day and night. How does he express his delight? By meditating upon the word of the law of the Lord day and night. Um, by the way, I mentioned in the previous thing, there's a big difference between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation. Now look at this. Look at this contest. What does it say? Uh, he meditates on his law day and night. That is how we express it. We meditate upon the law. Now, the basic difference between in Eastern meditation, you empty your mind. And you let whatever comes in, comes in. In biblical meditation, you fill your mind with the scriptures. You contemplate a verse. You memorize that verse. You reflect upon that verse and what it, uh, what it means in its original setting. And, uh, and then also what it, what it means for you. So we go and we see both what it's what you exegete it. You come to understand what it says, and then you see how it applies to you, and you meditate upon it that way, and you turn it over and look at it from various different angles. And that's what it means to meditate scripturally: is you fill your mind with scripture. Unfortunately, most of us meditate upon the entertainment industry and we fill our mind with all this entertainment stuff not realizing what it's teaching us or what it's actually instilling in our lives. Instead we should meditate upon the Word of God day and night according to the scripture. Now let us look at the chiasmos on a larger scale. Now on Psalm 8, I've already referred to Psalm 8 and it begins with an inclusio so we can see this and you see that in Psalm 8 verse Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And it concludes with the same line. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And if we continue, in fact, if we rearrange, and that's what I'm going to do here, is I'm going to actually rearrange this psalm as we might have written it for ourselves. And uh, so you get the sense. Now, the is uh, contrast verses 1b through 2. By the way, when you see that little B at the end of a verse, it implies it's like the second part of the verse. And that bounces off with 6 and 7. In the first part, it's God's rule in heaven. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the adventure. On the other hand, you have humanity's rule on the earth. You know, God's glory is set in the heavens. And then humanity's rule on the earth. You have given him, humanity, dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beast of the field and the birds of heavens and the fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Now notice this here about the man being placed in dominion over nature and being responsible for nature before him or before the natural order. And now that we go on and we conclude and we have these two, we have the smallness of humanity continued brought up in verse 3 of, um, of Psalm at the beginning. It says, when I look upon your heavens, notice looking toward the heavens, and at the work of your fingers, the moons and stars, which you have set in place, and then the central question, which is actually part of this section, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You know, who is man? When you look at the heavens, who is man? I mean, man is just an insignificant creature on this earth. When you compare it to the heavens, there's just, there's no comparison whatsoever. And then it talks about the greatness of man. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Notice, where would we expect these heavenly beings? That would be in the heavens. Now, there's a textual issue there. Um... Uh, but the point is, you you um, the contrast is, you know, man is insignificant compared to the heavenly beings, and yet the heavens, and yet God has made him, uh, has made humanity a little lower, and has crowned him with honor. 
In fact, we can kind of see how this develops here as we go through here. It says, O Lord, how 